Hello everyone and welcome to this episode of Ignition Time. Some brand new information is now emerging about the negotiations surrounding the infrastructure bill, what the White House is doing, who the White House is actually negotiating with. One thing is for sure folks, they're definitely not negotiating with the media. Welcome to this channel, everyone. My name is Dr. Nitin Choda with Ignition Time. Right here is a little bit of information about me. You'll learn more about who I am, what my journey has been like and why you should listen to me. Let's just jump right into the news. President Biden is considering canceling as much as $50,000 in student loan debt. And this is something that the president is looking into. This would be a $50,000 stimulus for students. Also, the president is essentially calling out Republicans for opposing the infrastructure bill when they suggested the components of the infrastructure bill in the past, in the first place. First, let's start with the inequality that exists in our country. Here's the headline of an article on your screen from the Washington Post. Dozens of America's big businesses paid no federal income taxes yet again. 55 corporations, folks, had zero tax liability in 2020. In other words, they paid zero federal income taxes in 2020, including, including companies you've heard about like Nike, FedEx, and Dish Network. Unbelievable. In fact, this information is from the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. You'll see that article on your screen right now. 55 corporations paid zero in federal income taxes on 2020 profits as we scroll down this page. We'll provide you with a link to this article in the description section below. Let's check out this list of 55 profitable companies and let's scroll down this list. 55 profitable companies that paid zero federal income taxes in the year 2020. Let's scroll down this list. And as we scroll down, I'm pretty sure that you'll recognize many of these companies. Again, they paid no federal income taxes for profits made in 2020 when when individuals in travel, leisure, entertainment and hospitality had lost their jobs forever. They continued to make money and, and this is a trend that has been building for decades. In fact, let's take a look at 26 companies that paid zero or lower federal income taxes since the Trump tax cuts so far. On your screen, you'll see 26 companies, again, that paid zero or lower corporate taxes since the Trump tax cuts in 2017. Let's go down this list. And again, there'll probably be companies here that you can recognize. And these are companies that continue to make more money and did not pay any and or paid little federal income tax. Now, I want to be clear, these companies are using the law, using legal means to reduce their taxes. Here's a quote from one of the authors of the study. By all appearances, the company described in this report appear to be using entirely legal means to reduce their tax bills according to the lead author of the study Matthew Gardner uh, but that doesn't mean the companies are blameless he said many of the tax provisions these companies are using exist because the companies themselves have lobbied heavily for their creation. In other words, the companies use their power to get the law passed by Congress in 2017, and now they're reaping the rewards. Speaking of reaping the rewards, it's very clear that President Biden is pushing the infrastructure plan. In fact, in brand new comments, President Biden called out the Republicans for their opposition to the infrastructure plan because the infrastructure plan from the Republicans included many of the same proposals under the American Jobs Plan, including broadband and trains. Let's hear from the President of the United States. We talked about a lot about infrastructure today. And it's kind of interesting that when the Republicans put forward an infrastructure plan, they thought everything from broadband to dealing with other things was trains or infrastructure. Now they're saying that there's only a small portion of what I'm talking about is infrastructure. The fact of the matter is that when you're in a situation where you can't turn out a water fountain in school and worry you're going to drink polluting water and your health, you're replacing all those types of infrastructure. And as all this is happening, the president is speaking, is asking his education secretary to see if the president can legally cancel federal student debt. President Biden has asked the education secretary to prepare a memo on the president's legal authority to cancel up to 50 thousand dollars in student loan debt and keep in mind that president biden has said he doesn't want to bypass congress as far as the fifty thousand dollar elimination of student loan debt is concerned it looks like it looks like the president because of pressure from his own party has asked his own education secretary if he can do something on his own unilaterally without requiring congress Let's now hear from the White House economic advisor, Brian Deese, who was interviewed by Chris Wallace from Fox News on Easter Sunday. And Brian Deese was making the case 
for this massive infrastructure spending and Chris Wallace to his credit asked a bunch of uh, pretty pretty insightful questions and tried to put Brian Deese on the spot and I think this is a very interesting interview let's take a look at the first segment of the interview where Brian Deese makes the case for infrastructure spending and says more investment will lead to more jobs and will lead to better jobs let's watch this interesting exchange between chris wallace from fox news and the white house senior economic advisor brian deese let's watch question given all that does the country need another two trillion dollars in federal spending in this bill and trillions more in another bill that the president is going to lay out sometime in the next few weeks we're talking about another at least four trillion dollars in more government spending well the jobs numbers in march were certainly a welcome sign uh, it's good to see the economy starting to improve and we certainly think that it's a sign that the economic and vaccination strategy that this administration has put into place from day one uh, is starting to have an impact but we have a long way to go. We still are down 8.4 million jobs from where we were a year ago. We have millions of people out of work. More than 2 million women have left the labor force because they've had to choose between caring for their family members and their jobs. And so we have a long way to go. What our plan says is let's keep the uh, economy going. Let's see more job creation. That's a really good thing for the economy. But let's also think to the longer term about where are those investments that we could make that will really drive not just more job growth, but better job growth. Not just job growth in the short term, but job growth in the long term by investing in our infrastructure, by investing in our research and development in a way that we haven't since the 1960s. If we do that, we think we can not only have a strong job rebound this year, but we could sustain it over many years. That's the goal. Let, 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 let's talk about this. The White House basically calls this an infrastructure bill. And yes, there are hundreds of billions of dollars for roads and highways and bridges and, and for some other things that I think you can argue are infrastructure, like expanding broadband. But there are also some other parts of this bill, and I want to put them up. Uh, $213 billion for housing, $400 billion dollars for taking care of the elderly and disabled. Brian, uh, those may well be worthy projects, but they're not infrastructure. Well, look, I think we really need to update the, what we mean by infrastructure for the 21st century. Uh, if you look at that number on housing, what we're talking about is construction, building housing all around the country to help make sure that uh, there are more affordable housing units for people to access jobs and access economic opportunity. We're talking about construction to build things like VA facilities, our schools and community colleges, putting people to work, construction work that really needs to be done to meet commitments that we have to our veterans and others. Uh, and they, we believe that the infrastructure of our care economy is something we have to take very seriously. If for anybody uh, out there, many of your viewers who are parents, uh, who are taking care of an elderly parent or an adult child with disabilities, they know that if you don't have an infrastructure of care to support your loved ones, you can't effectively work. You can't effectively interact in the 21st century economy. So we think but, but investing I, I, in the look, infrastructure I, I get of care... Brian, I'm not going to argue uh, about whether or not it's a worthy project, but, but the infrastructure of care, you're really s s stretching the word beyond all meaning. What you're doing is you're going to pay people to take care of the elderly and disabled. I mean, it's a social program. Well, we're going to invest in building child care facilities. We're going to invest in upgrading home and community-based care facilities. We're going to invest in our VA hospitals. We're going to invest in putting people to work, building and addressing deferred maintenance and addressing the lack of access to this type of care that keeps parents from being able to work, that keeps families from being able to work. That will create more jobs. It'll create more opportunity for people to get into the workforce. It'll expand our economy's potential. Now, when Brian was pushed by Chris Wallace about is this absolutely necessary how are we going to pay for this he said this is a one-time eight-year capital investment and he highlighted the importance of trying to get this plan passed and it was a very very interesting interview let's roll the tape and check out this segment the president says that this bill is paid for with two trillion dollars in increased corporate taxes uh, but you pay uh, for eight years of spending with 15 years of taxes. And Brian, 
Uh, this is, as you well know, this is a classic Washington gimmick because when you're paying for eight years of spending with 15 years of taxes, the fact is the Biden administration, it will be long gone and a new president will be in and a new Congress will be in. And oftentimes they repeal those tax increases. No, I think it's just the opposite. This is a capital investment. What we're talking about with the infrastructure plan is a one-time eight-year capital investment. And just like any good business or even a family would make a capital investment, you make that up front and then you pay for it over time. What we're saying is that we would pay for it over a 15-year period. And in fact, it's fiscally responsible over the long term because it would actually reduce debt uh, after that 15-year period as well. Look, we get that we're going to have a conversation about how we need to pay for this investment and other investments. The president laid out his plan. One thing he was very clear on this week is he would like to hear other people's ideas. If people think that this is uh, too aggressive, then we'd like to hear what their plans are. It's something we want to have a conversation about. But this is a responsible way to pay for a significant capital investment, which itself will return multiples in terms of the private investment it will unlock. We see uh, analysts from across the spectrum right. saying that we make investments in things like our ports and airports. We'll un unleash significant private investment as well. We think it's a reasonable thing to pay for that across time, but you don't have to do it year for year. I, I, I want to pick up on exactly your point because the president made it clear he's willing to negotiate. He's willing to compromise. Here he is this week. I'm going to bring Republicans into the Oval Office, listen to them, what they have to say, and be open to other ideas. Is the president willing, you say he's willing to compromise, is he willing to come down, and if so, how far from the $2.25 trillion uh, spending bill that, uh, that he's talking about here, from the price tag? And in terms of paying for it, is he willing, instead of corporate taxes, to do what usually is done with infrastructure, which is to base it on user fees, whether it's increasing the gas tax or uh, a new mileage tax. Well, the president has put forward his plan. Uh, some people have said it's too much. Some people have said it's too little. We think it's just right. About $2 trillion over eight years investing in core drivers of growth, like our roads and bridges, like high-speed internet, like research and development. And what he said, and, and as you say, we're, we want to have this conversation. We're starting the outreach already. Uh, I've talked to dozens but of but members but of Congress to get a sense, over the Brian, of this I, week. Well, and in the final segment, when Brian was specifically pushed about, hey, again, how are you going to get this done? Are you going to make this bipartisan? Are we going to get, are the Democrats going to get cooperation from the Republicans? Brian D. said, we want to hear ideas. This is the beginning of the process, indicating that there is some flexibility as far as as far as the Biden administration is concerned, or at least that's what they seem to be conveying. Folks, politics is about timing, opportunity, tribalism, and perception. The perception that the White House is trying to create is that, oh, we're open to ideas, but let's see if they try and push this through also with budget reconciliation. Let's roll this segment and hear from Brian Deese, the White House Senior Economic Advisor. Let me uh, talk to you about another aspect of this, which is you've got uh, a lot of opposition inside the Democratic Party and in, in the House, you can only lose three votes in the Senate. You can't lose any votes and, and pass this measure. Uh, moderate Democrats in the House are saying they will not vote for this package unless that you're willing to lift the cap on deductions for state and local taxes. And then you've got people on the left who say this isn't big enough. Take a look at uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez this week. We're the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. So we can do 10 trillion. Are those negotiable? Uh, not two trillion, ten trillion. Uh, the, the 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 cap on deductions for state and local taxes. Look, we've we've said we want to hear people's ideas, and this is the beginning of the process. Uh, uh, we were just talking about how to pay for it. Those are both ideas that would cost more, so we'd want to hear how people are thinking about how they would uh, offset those ideas. So what I would say is. The, uh, the, the, this is a good faith effort. We want to hear people's ideas. We think that investing about $2 trillion over this period would make a huge difference. You look at just the analyses we've seen this week, Moody's suggests it would create 19 million jobs. <laughs> Goldman Sachs is projecting more than 7% right. growth this year if we pass the investment and the corporate tax plan. So we think we have a really opportunity to do something big here. 
and we got to get into that and listen to people's ideas and that's something we're going to be open that's it everyone thank you so much for watching my name is dr nitin choda with ignition time if you learn something new please click the like button please subscribe please enable notifications i would really really appreciate that that helps out the youtube algorithm my goal is to bring you the latest news news that impacts the country the economy as well as your money for me it's not about the red or the blue it's about the red white and blue i'm not democrat i'm not republican i'm american we are all americans first let me know what you think i'm looking forward to seeing you in the next episode of ignition time take care bye